Shalom friends, welcome to Jewish Holiday Reactions. On today's episode, Sukkot, otherwise known as Camping in Huts of Questionable Structural Integrity, while surrounded by bees week, the high holidays do not quit. They have absolutely zero chill. Although, of course, you can certainly catch a chill on Sukkot, depending on where you live. Because during the holiday, Jews are supposed to leave our permanent homes, go outside, and camp in a sukkah. A sukkah is a temporary booth. The roof is made out of branches through which we can see the stars. The vibe? Lothlorien. Sukkot is one of three pilgrimage festivals mentioned in the Torah. The other two are Passover and Shavuot. The sukkah itself is a little reenactment of how farmers in ancient Israel would camp out during the harvest season in their fields. The sukkah also reminds us of that time we escaped from Egypt and were wandering in the desert for 40 years, but nobody had remembered to pack their Patagonia tent and a sleeping bag. So we had to make huts. For those of us here in New England, Sukkot marks a symbolic beginning of the fall aesthetic, like it's the pumpkin spice latte of Judaism. Building and decorating a sukkah can be loads of fun, until you get to the part where you have to put the branches on the roof. Because at that point, there's a 10 billion percent chance that your dog, if you have one, and your neighbor's dog, if you don't have a dog, will run over, say, hey, thanks for the sticks, grab the branches out of your hands, run to the other side of the yard, and chew them before you even know what's happening. Has this happened to me? I don't even know how many times. Once they have built and decorated their sukkah, Jews are supposed to spend as much time as possible in it. For example, that means eating all meals there. During the high holidays, Jews dip their challah in honey to be symbolic of a sweet new year, which is great, but that's also how you get the aforementioned bees. And it's not just bees. I remember one time I had to stare down a gang of squirrels who were trying to abscond with their challah. I won that battle of wills and they ended up having to take a decorative gourd as a consolation prize for their failed heist. There are some people who, inexplicably, don't mind being stared at by raccoons and possibly an owl in the middle of the night, and those people sleep in the sukkah as well, to each their own. Now, random animals are not actually the intended guests at a sukkah. They really just crash the party. They do not have an invite. Rather, we're meant to welcome in human guests. This is perfect for your friends and family who are COVID conscious and don't really want to eat inside anyway. To my fellow immunocompromised siblings and Moses, solidarity. Now we don't only invite living people over to the sukkah on Sukkot, and no, I don't mean zombies though. I mean that each night we welcome in the spirits of our ancestors into our sukkah with us as our guests. VIPs like Avraham and Sarah, Yitzchak and Rivka, Moshe and Miriam, you get the idea. VIPs in this context obviously means very important progenitors. Now, another guest that you might actually want to invite into your sukkah is Benadryl, because we get yet more plants for another iconic Sukkot ritual. It uses four species of plants, a closed palm frond, a willow branch, and a myrtle branch. Those three branches are bound together and we collectively refer to them as the lulav, even though technically that's just the palm. It's like a band named after the egotistical frontman. The fourth species is an etrog. The etrog is a citrus fruit, kind of like a lemon, except a really fancy, incredibly expensive, high-maintenance lemon. It is a major Sukkot flex if your etrog is dope as fuck. So the mitzvah is to take these four plants and hold them together. Then you wave them in six directions, north, south, east, west, up, down. The trick here is to somehow do this without accidentally shanking somebody in the eye with the palm frond because that thing is hella sharp. There are many things represented by the four species. Etrog as heart, palm as spine, myrtle as eyes, willow as lips. There's also an idea that the four species correspond to the Tetragrammaton, the incredibly powerful four-letter name of God that we cannot say, except really important people like the Baal Shem Tov, who use the Tetragrammaton to teleport and, occasionally, battle sorcerers. Like you do. But yeah, he was an outlier. My favorite interpretation is that the plants represent different kinds of Jews. We're different, and yet we're still part of the same people. Being in the sukkah forces us to go outside of our comfort zone, literally. For those of us who are lucky enough to normally have a roof over our heads, it reminds us that many people live in temporary housing or do not have housing at all. In the midst of the joyousness of the season, this reminder from Sukkot is actually incredibly valuable. Far more valuable, in fact, than even the best looking and most expensive etrog on planet Earth. Chag Sukkot Sameach, everybody, and stay safe from those bees. Oh, fuck.